So I'd like to begin by asking a question. What if space was open to you? Not to NASA, not Congress, not SpaceX, you. Closer to the mic. What would you do? Louder. Where would you go? We're working on something that will put any person, any group of like-minded individuals, any school and any business into space. But how do you do such a thing? You need a new type of spacecraft, not a multi-billion dollar Mars rover or Dragon capsule, but something much smaller and cheaper. And this is why 20 years ago, the CubeSat was invented. But what is a CubeSat? CubeSat is a satellite made of a small modular 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cubes. And these cubes can be assembled into larger and larger satellites. These cubes are composed of several subsystems, for example, avionic structure, avionics, radio, payload, power transmission, and power generation. These subsystems come together to build a complete satellite. The problem is they're all super expensive. A modern CubeSat platform today can have super low specs and yet cost $25,000. And even at this price, it includes no payloads and is extremely bare bones, no cameras, it can only receive and transmit. In contrast, a modern iPhone is many, many times more powerful than this satellite and includes many advanced cameras and sensors and yet it costs 25 times less. So it's pretty obvious that the solution here is to build satellites like you build phones. And as you can see here, once you do that, as seen in these three products, which are currently under development by us, you can get much, much higher performance at a radically lower cost. Um, and then thus revolutionize every single product category you enter by using this approach. This is not just hypothetical. A few days ago, we did our first launch with United Launch Alliance. Now this was just suborbital, it did not stay in orbit, just went up and returned. But in December, we were doing our first orbital launch with Firefly Aerospace on the main flight of the Firefly Alpha rocket. Um, we were building a new payload to test and validate our space systems in collaboration with FOSS Systems, a Spanish nonprofit open source group. So uh, we are currently seeking support and funding for this, uh, for building the hardware for this launch, which is coming up very, very soon. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm Gaffin Avram for Astro Group, and we're bringing satellites to you. Um, so cool work uh, and congrats on your launch uh, in uh, every sense. Um, so in five years, so there's around like 2,000 CubeSats in orbit right now, right? Actually, to be honest with you, I think it's significantly lower than that. I think there are less than 1,000 in orbit right now. And mm, okay. in orbit and functioning. I don't know about the ones that stop working. I see. Got it. Um, okay, so on the order of maybe hundreds of thousands. Yes. Okay. Um, how many do you think there, if, if kind of CubeSats work, um, how many do you think there will be in, call it five years? So this is a really interesting question. Um, I'd like to first start with the example of Planet Labs, who out of the, the like I think they have more CubeSats in orbit right now, they have 300, they have more than everyone else combined, I think. Mm -hmm. Speaking of just operational ones. No. Um, sorry, my phone issues here. Um, so essentially, um, I think that uh, first of all, it shows how satellites, which companies which use swarms of small satellites, can deploy like hundreds of them. Yeah. They launched 88 in one launch, but that's only the beginning because mm -hmm. um, in several years, the SpaceX Starship will be coming online. And at that point, that's when the revolution, um, the singularity of space travel um, is arriving. And um, essentially, I've, I've done the math. And if you could even use just 1% of the internal space of the Starship for CubeSat payloads, just 1%, you would still be able to launch 10,000 CubeSats in a single launch. And yeah, I, I fully believe the will have the capacity to launch a lot. The thing that I don't understand as well is what they'll all be used for and you know kind of mapping and sort of geospatial stuff out of planet labs obviously makes a lot of sense and so like, uh, the, the question i wonder about is um you know wh wh what's use case number five what's use case sort of number 10. so i think one of the emerging use cases that only becomes possible once we get radically low cost uh, launch capability is the capacity of this to become um 20 years ago um, you know, small, the idea of a small personal robotics kit was mm -hmm. pretty crazy. And then came along Lego Mindstorms. And so I think uh, as someone who in high school built a satellite, uh, a CubeSat, 
it, it is one probably the greatest STEM experience someone can have, period. Um, and so if this can be um, in the same way we have first today, I think that's a, a potentially massive, massive. Um, so kind um, of the, the educational, pedagogical, hobbyist. Exactly. Got it. So, so, so this is in some sense for people who might, you know, otherwise pursue, you know, those, uh, those high altitude balloons. Exactly. Um, how to do balloons, several of the launches, and right. other hobbies, projects altogether. Um, yep. Drones. And so, say all this works, and um, you know, you're selling, you know, I don't know, the kits for ten thousand cubesats a year. Um, would there be obvious uh, adjacencies to then expand into? So. I think one of the uh, most interesting, there are several interesting things I've thought about. One is um, the idea of making them recoverable so they can come back um, to Earth safely. And that way you can actually um, do recoverable biological payloads, um, which is not a massive market, but it's a highly, it's extremely hard to get into if you have a biological payload you want to fly to. Mm. How, how would you make them recoverable? That's very interesting. So. The best with a CubeSat, the best way is um, you would probably use an inflatable heat shield on the front. Mm. Actually, it's not just a wild idea, it's actually been researched. You can use mm. a heat shield, which can fit. What to use for propulsion? So, propulsion, there are nowadays many, many small cell propulsion mm. companies. I think electric is probably the best for low Earth orbit. But for mm. the other interesting market, I think. And when you say electric, what, what are you doing? I mean, like, there's um, several companies like Axion, I think, is one of the most interesting, and um, Busek and Exoterra. And electric, I mean, like, plasma thrusters, electro spray mm -hmm. thrusters, which. Got it. Uh, yeah. Um, but in addition, one thing I would personally really love to do is to go into the new, very extremely new interplanetary CubeSat um, world, which is it's not a commercial thing as much as it is a. Uh, NASA thing, NASA contract thing, mm. um, which I mean, if you could, if you could launch, if you use CubeSats, you could in a single launch build like um, a Starlink for Mars or for the Moon or a GPS mm -hmm. for the Moon. Yeah, uh, how much do you think we should worry about you know the sort of um, debris cascade, you know uh, Kessler syndrome stuff? So sometimes I think I should name my company Kessler Aerospace. <laughs> as a joke. Um, but um, I think that if you, the debris problem can be mitigated if for these low cost like CubeSats, you designate several so called um, debris orbits uh, in, in inclinations which are frequently not used by any other satellites. You reserve several inclinations and several. Okay, but, 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 but you think that it, it is a problem that will require active mitigation? Yes. So. The first step is to track them. Well, actually, on, on, on that note, it's, well, it's good to know you're thinking about it, but I think we are out of time. All right. Thank you so much. Um, but cool project, um, and uh, very best of luck. Thank you. And cool live stream, man. And thanks to the Pioneer organizers for having me.